Hey, this is the ghost host Sophia Temporelli of LiveParanormal.com, and you're watching Five Paranormal Investigations. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Five Files. I am your host, Jake Fife, and today we're going to talk a little bit about some of my personal experiences during my time in the paranormal field. You know, so far before we get into this, has everyone had a good 2019 so far? What are your New Year's resolutions? What is one thing that you want to accomplish this year? It could be a small thing. It could be a big thing. Leave your comments, thoughts below. I've been in the paranormal field so far for nine years. It's hard to believe it's been nine years. It feels like yesterday I was discovering my dad's old tape recorder that he used to record EVPs and his old cameras and his old tapes. It seemed like just yesterday I was learning how to use all of that stuff and start my own sessions. And now, nine years later, I have a lot of equipment, a lot of experience. I've investigated a lot of cool locations. And I've had some pretty neat experiences during my time, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Before we get into that, if you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to leave a like and comment below, and feel free to share. And also check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash Paranormal. So the paranormal field has always been a part of my life. It's something that, you know, wherever I've been, it seems the paranormal has either followed me or just made its presence known to me. Uh, The very first paranormal experience I can remember is when I was very, very young. Very, very young. I remember laying in bed, and it was in the middle of the night, and I looked down this kind of long hallway we had, and at the very end, there was another room that you could see just barely. You could barely make it out, and there was always a bathroom about halfway down the hallway that had a nightlight. So, you know, part of the hallway was lit, and you could see the entrance to the other room. And I remember waking up late, late one night and seeing shadow people just going in and out of the bathroom, going down the hallway, up the hallway, just, you know, moving around. And it was weird because it didn't seem like they were trying to get anywhere. It didn't seem like, you know, they had a plan in mind of what they were doing. It just seemed like they were kind of there. They were kind of just, you know, going into one room, going out, walking around the hallway, going into a room, they coming out. It was, when I look back on it now, it was very strange. And one thing I do when I have a paranormal experience, whether it's, you know, past or present, I try to look for, you know, a natural cause. You know, it could have been this, could have been that. Try to debunk it. Because that's what I do as a paranormal investigator. If something happens, before I call it paranormal, I try to debunk it. And for this, I mean, unless I was dreaming, which that is a possibility that I could have dreamed this whole incident, but it felt so real and I felt like I was awake. I know I was awake, but, you know, there's always that off chance it could have been a dream. But I try to analyze experiences like, you know, something as simple as hearing a voice. Is there a message behind this encounter, that voice, the message it was relaying to me? Why did it make its presence known to me at this specific time? Different things like that. And when I look back on that experience, the whole thing lasted maybe 10 seconds. Just a 10-second experience that has stuck with me for, you know, over 10 years, 13, 15 years, how long it's been since that experience. But I don't remember ever figuring out a reason for why those shadow people, one, appeared, two, why they were just going in and out of the rooms. I remember there were two of them. They were just one would, you know, they had changed between going into the room at the end of the hall, going into bed, just walking really fast, you know, not superhumanly fast, like some shadow people do, just walking at a very fast pace. And then, you know, years later, when I was eight years old, actually nine years old, we lived in the deep mountains of southern West Virginia. And, you know, we were pretty much surrounded on all sides by woods. And there was one road that went in, one road that went out. And up on the ridge above our house, there was a water tank that was being constructed. And I remember about two weeks before we moved, I was sitting outside on the porch. Something that I always did when I would come home from school is, you know, I would come home from school, obviously. That's what you do when you come home from school. I would throw my book bag inside, more like open the door, toss it in, and hope it didn't break anything on impact. And then I would go back out onto the porch. I'd open the gate we had, and I'd let my dogs up on the porch, my Australian Shepherds. And, you know, I'd pet them, you know, me being nine years old, I'd be like, hey, I'd be talking to them, that kind of stuff. What a kid does, you know, when they're playing with dogs. And I remember when I was looking around, I was petting the dogs, and I noticed a figure standing by the water tank about 50 yards up above the house. 
And I remember at that moment, everything seemed like it stopped. Like, um, you know, paranormal investigators, you can probably relate to this. When you have an experience like that where you either hear something definitive with your own ears, like there's no... Um, there's no explanations. You know you just heard a spirit voice. Or you come around the corner and you see a shadow figure standing in the middle of the room or at the end of a hallway, and you know there's no mistaking it. You you are witnessing a paranormal event. And one, you know you're not crazy, but two, it's like, holy crap, this is kind of wild. But one thing that happens during those experiences is it seems like time either slows down or stands still for just that brief little moment in time. And when I saw that figure up at the water tank, that's what I experienced. And I remember, you know, thinking, who is that? Because I thought it was a real person. It looked like a person. It was just, you know, it was an all black figure, looked to be about, you know, six one, six foot two. And they looked like they were holding something in their right hand, almost like a walking stick, a staff, a spear, something like that. They just had something that was outstretched a little bit in their right hand. And I remember the crazy thing about it was my dogs, they looked up at the water tank and they started barking and growling and just going nuts. And they took off running off that porch and running up the hill, barking, growling, making these god-awful sounds, going towards this thing. And the figure, I could feel it looking directly at me. And the entire time I saw it, it didn't really move at all. It just kind of, it stood there. I never saw it walk out from the tower It was just standing there, just watching me. I could feel it looking me in the eye. And then as soon as my dogs got maybe 10 or 15 yards away from the figure, it stopped, looked at them, and walked behind the water tank. You know, and I was waiting. I stood there waiting to see the figure come out on the other side of the water tower. Because, you know, I was still thinking it could have been a real person. I was like, well, surely they didn't just disappear. I would have seen them. My dogs would have continued to chase after them. But... The person never showed up on the other side of the water tower. And my dog stopped chasing it. They got up to the water tank. They just stopped and looked around confused. And it was at that moment that I decided, you know, nine years ago, I decided I have to figure out what's happening. Because I'd had many other experiences during my life from, you know, age three up until that time, age nine. But I had never really sat down either with my dad, who had been an investigator since the late 80s, early 90s, or I never really looked online to see, you know, what did I just experience? What did I just see? What exactly is going on? But after that experience is when I decided I was going to. So fast forward about a month. We're moved into our new house, the house we're currently in now, which is very, very haunted, trust me. And I remember we would hear footsteps upstairs in our old, old house. The house was built around 1880, so it's a very, very old house. The oldest house I believe I've ever lived in. And it would happen, you know, maybe two or three times a week. Either we'd all be downstairs or we'd be sleeping in our rooms. And you could hear what sounded like someone walking upstairs, you know, just up, well, not really up and down the hallway. Sometimes it'd be like, they'd start at the end of the hallway and they go towards the stairs and then they'd do like halfway coming back and then it'd stop. Or sometimes it would go at the end and you could hear them on the top two stairs because, you know, well, they're really old stairs, they creak. You know, it's just like a horror movie. They make those really loud, obvious creaking sounds and you could hear that like, eh, eh. And then it'd stop. And you'd be waiting for the others. Like, you know, one time we were all downstairs watching a movie. And we could hear someone. It sounded like someone with boots on was walking down the hallway. And we even stopped the movie. And we were all just looking at each other as this was happening. And, you know, this whole thing happened for about 10 seconds. You could hear boom, boom, boom. And it was weird because, you know, they weren't walking at, like, a normal pace. Um... They almost looked like they were observing the changes we had made to the house so far, you know, bringing our new stuff in, putting new stuff in the rooms. And it looks like, you know, they were just wanting to see what we were doing. And I'll never forget, we all just stopped, looked at each other, and I got off the couch, and I went out into the downstairs hallway, directly underneath the upstairs hallway floor, and I could hear the vibrations of this thing, this person, whatever it was, walking in the house. 
And I'll never forget, part of me wanted to go down the hall a little bit just to see if there was someone out there, but another part of me said, no, don't. So, you know, what I would have seen had I walked down, I don't know. Part of me wishes now that I had, but I think sometimes when we interrupt activity by inserting us into the moment, it ruins it because, you know, they might be on a sort of like a residual fixed path. But when you add either our energy, our reaction to that moment, that little scene that's unfolding, I think sometimes it can mess it up. And that's why, you know, some people will say, we hear footsteps, but when we go into the room, it stops. That could be a potential reason. But I remember standing at the edge of the hallway. I could see the stairs. And it's the footsteps stopped for a second. And we thought the entire encounter was done. But we heard, I heard especially, and I saw the stairs dust fall down. The top two stairs creak. And I could see the dust falling down like something was kicking the dust off. And, you know, I'm standing directly underneath those stairs. I didn't see anybody. I could hear it. I could hear the footsteps. I could see the dust fall where something or someone was making the dust fall. But... I couldn't see anything with my own eyes. And it was shortly after that time when, you know, like I said earlier in the intro of the show, I started using my dad's old equipment. I learned how to use it, started doing my own EVP sessions. Then for, um, it was, uh, oh God, what was it? It was Easter of that year. I got my very first digital voice recorder. It was a very simple Olympus voice recorder. Not this, it wasn't high tech, but it was a good enough start. And I, we actually still use it every once in a while on investigations, uh, predominantly as like a note taker, or if we have a camera set up somewhere like our trail camera, we'll set up the recorder next to it just in case, you know, the trail camera picks up, you know, figure of something, see if we can record footsteps or a noise to back it up. But I remember as soon as I got that, I put the batteries in and I was off, <laughs> I did so many EVP sessions, not really in the house. That was something that my dad taught me, Chris taught me early on, is don't starting out, don't do sessions either in your own room or your own house until you know how to properly open and close the door to the other side. Because when you speak to the other side, you invite the other side to communicate with you. It is like opening your front door and shouting to the world, Hey, whoever wants to come in and talk can talk. That's basically what it is. And you have to learn at the very end or when you're done, you're uncomfortable, to close that door and tell the spirits, this is it. This is done. Once this door is closed, you cannot communicate with me or anyone else until we give you permission again. And, you know, sometimes spirits, they'll make their presence known anyway. But that's what I was always told to do. That's what I still do to this day, and it works. Now, you may be listening to this and thinking, well, that's not how we do it, but, you know, every person has their own approach to the paranormal field. Everyone has their own reasons for being in this field. Everyone has their own reasons for, you know, why they do what they do, whether it's paranormal or really life in general. I believe that's true, but I remember there's this old kitchen because, you know, when they used to build houses, they used to have the kitchen separate. One, because, you know, if something went wrong and the kitchen burned down, you didn't burn down your entire house. And then two, you didn't want your whole house filled with smoke if something you were cooking got really smoky. So I would go out into the old kitchen outside, maybe about 10, 15 yards from the house, and I would do my EVP sessions in there. And, you know, I didn't, I think out of all the sessions I ever did there, which was maybe 150 to 200, something like that, over the course of three to four years, I might have caught one or two things of interest, maybe, if I was lucky. But it was more of what I was learning, both by not getting any evidence, and then also every time I would go out and record a session, Because, you know, every time I would learn, okay, this is how you feel the environment. This is how you detect changes, you know, with your mind, with your body. Like, you know, when I asked this certain question, I noticed it either got warmer or colder. And then you learn, okay, could have been the wind kicking up, 
Is there a draft or is this a spirit presence? And so I learned very early on how to detect these changes and, you know, not only how to debunk them as, you know, natural causes, natural phenomena, even human error, human causes, but also how to detect paranormal activity, genuine paranormal activity. And something I think is very key is when something happens, an investigator having the ability to very quickly narrow it down where the voice was heard from, where the voice was coming from, where the shadow was, and where it was going, what it was doing. The quicker you can do that, the quicker you can react, and the quicker you can get yourself, your equipment, and your team to that area for your best chance of you know, following up that experience with either another really cool experience or really great evidence or both. So um, a few years later, about 2014, it was actually 20, yeah, it was about 2014 in the fall, the town that we live near has a local ghost tour that still does to this day. And one of the things that they had was a spirit box tour. And it was, you know, you go on the tour to this old haunted train depot and you get a chance to talk to the spirits yourself. And at the time, we had no idea what a spirit box was. We had heard of, you know, the ghost box and spirits speak over radios and you know, we had seen some classic horror movies where that was kind of like a plot or a plot device, but we had never seen it used in person. We have never actually taken part in a spirit box session. And so, Chris and I went one night. It was in September, it was early September. And I remember it was kind of a warm night, slight breeze. And as soon as the PSB7 spirit box, which is what they were using, kicked on, it was almost like a whole new aspect of the paranormal revealed itself to us the idea that you don't have to wait you know a few hours or a day or two to hear what you recorded on an investigation because that's one thing about the paranormal that you know I was always kind of a bummer like a secret bummer. not a big bummer but a little bit of a bummer was you have this session you're sitting in a sanatorium. You're doing an EVP session. You feel like something's happening. You're like, I feel, you know, cold spots everywhere. My hair's standing up on the back of my neck and on my arms. I'm asking these questions that I think are really, really good. But am I getting responses? I don't know. I can't stop because it'll ruin the momentum. I'll have to check it out, you know, tomorrow or a few days from now whenever you get a chance. And that always kind of sucked that, you know, you have to be patient. And you have to wait because, you know, well, the spirit box, you get those responses in real time. And, you know, whether it's a good spirit making its presence known or a bad spirit or an evil spirit or an evil entity making its presence known, it gives you the ability to change up the investigation. Because, you know, you may do a regular EVP session with just a voice recorder and never know that a demonic entity is talking to you and threatening you and doing crazy things like that. Or you may never know that you're talking with the former owners of the house. That's giving you intelligent answers. You never know. But with the spirit box, you know, you do know in the moment, like, hey, we're getting this spirit voice that doesn't sound human. Let's, you know, buckle down on our defenses. Let's do what we do that makes us feel safe, comfortable, and calm. And you can deal with it like that. Or if you're talking to the former owner of the house that's giving you intelligent answers, you can ask location-specific questions. Instead of asking the same, is anybody here? What's your name? Did you die here? Those same questions. Because I think spirits do get bored of those questions every once in a while. And I think it is good to ask location-specific questions. And that's one of the big reasons why I do as much historical research as I can about a location so that you know if you can get I think the number one piece of evidence you can get aside from you know video and photographic but when it comes to EVP is location intelligent questions such as you know if you're at St. Albans Sanatorium and you ask the spirits where are we and they say St. Albans that's a really good clip because you know not only did you record a spirit voice, you got a spirit voice responding intelligently to your question and giving a correct answer. That's really cool. Now, I'm not saying that 
you should stop doing EVP sessions and focus only on spirit box. I'm not saying that. I love doing EVP sessions. There's great. And there's a time and place for both. There's a time and place for spirit box sessions. There's a time and place for EVP sessions. And then there's a time and place for both. So getting back to my experiences, after we got the spirit box, I got the spirit box Christmas of 2014. And January 9th of 2015, which was my 15th birthday, Chris and I went out to the train depot in Stanton, Virginia, which is where that ghost tour was. And that was my very first real in the field investigation. And it's already been four years, it's hard to believe. But I had been to cemeteries previously and, you know, taking my voice recorder and asked questions. But in terms of putting all my theories, putting all my research and practice, you know, into play, that was the very first place. And it was a very, very active investigation. We were surprised. We were there. We got there at about 11, 15, something like that, p.m. It was freezing cold that night. It was only like, I think, 31, 32 degrees. So, you know, we were frozen solid, basically. But it, it was still fun. I have fun on every investigation. There's no joy for me like being on a paranormal investigation. But, you know, that was one of those nights where it was like, okay, this is cool, but I don't really like hypothermia. I hope we don't join the spirits by the end of this. But, you know, making jokes like that. But we ended up staying till about 12.30, 12.45. And during that time, we used the spirit box the entire time. And we recorded over 60 what was it, like 65, 66 spirit box responses. Now, not all of those were class A. Those were just how many voices we recorded in response to our questions. And that was really, really cool. And I saw that as a very successful investigation, especially since towards the end, we got this really weird, creepy voice that called itself a demon. And, you know, whether or not it really was or not, we may never know. Uh, looking back, it probably wasn't... Um, it had some juice to it because there was one point where it felt like the air was sucked out of the place. And, you know, typically human spirits can't do stuff like that unless they're supercharged for some reason. But in my personal opinion, I don't believe it was a full on demonic entity. But it was wild for me, my very first investigation, have a quote unquote demon show up. And during that time, Chris taught me, you know, there is a dark side to this field. There are dark entities that want to do harm. They want to do bad things, not just to other spirits, but even to the living, to us investigators. And so that experience taught me a whole new side of the paranormal, a side that I hadn't really, I had thought about before. And of course, you know, where I love movies, you can't help but see, you know, The Exorcist, The Amityville Horror, where everything strange that happens is a demon or an evil spirit that's trying to take your soul. So and that was when I started trying to completely you know, complete my research, you know, not just researching the good of the parent, but researching the bad and how to combat it, how to notice when it makes its presence known. And then fast forward years later, over the course of time, about 2016, um, it was June. I'm trying to remember the exact dates. June something of 2016, I went to this place called the Pocahontas Cemetery in Pocahontas, Virginia. And it was really cool for me because that was one of the locations Chris, my dad, had investigated in the 90s. And so, you know, I almost saw it as like the son is following in the father's footsteps, you know, all those cliches. But it was really cool because he had told me some stories of some voices he had recorded there. And he had told me some stories of some things he had seen and heard there. And I was like, wow, I really want to go there and see if it happens for myself. And I remember the very first time I was there, it felt different from other cemeteries I had been to. First off, it's on the side of a hill, and there's woods nearby, and there's something about it that, even though it's next to a semi-busy road, you feel isolated. You feel like when you get to the top of that cemetery, and you're at the edge of the woods, close to the top of this small ridge, you feel like you're alone, and you feel like a thousand eyes are on you, and it's a very weird experience. And I remember getting a few voices over the spear box, you know, nothing to, you know, flip out about. But 
it was really cool for me just being there where my dad had investigated years prior and now I had my own stories to tell about the place. And there were times where, you know, I thought I saw a shadow figure. I did record the sound of someone walking in the woods, even though no one was in the woods. And it was cool because, you know, one, that is one of the claims of the place is sometimes you can hear the spirits one, it had been described to me as they stalk you. Like, you know, you have your back turned and you can hear someone walking up behind you as if they're checking out what you're doing. And sometimes you can feel the energy of them either approving of what you're doing or disapproving of what you're doing. And it's weird when, you know, you can feel the emotion of something that, one, isn't alive, and two, you can't see. Like, you know, usually starts... I hear footsteps. I can feel something watching me. And then you get this energy like it feels angry. And it's very weird. You know, I remember early on, it's like, you know, how do you feel emotions off somebody? I mean, you know, when you when you're out in public and you see someone, you're talking to someone, you can judge by their body language, their body movements and their facial expressions, you know, how they're feeling. But when you're dealing with the paranormal, you can't exactly see the person face to face. And so it is harder to tell, but it's weird because when you're really in tune to the location and to the investigation, you'd be surprised at what you pick up, what your mind and body picks up. And so I remember a year after that, uh, 2017, we, I went again to the Pocana Cemetery on Halloween Day, and it was really, really cool being there. And it was strange because all the leaves had fallen. And, you know, like I said earlier, I went in June last time. And so, you know, everywhere, everywhere it had, you know, lush green grass or the trees were full of life. And when I went this time, the leaves were on the ground. The trees were dead. And it just... There's just this cold feeling to the place that, you know, of course it's fall. The leaves are going to be barren. There's The trees are going to look a little weirder, but there was something different about that trip up. And right away, I started getting what sounded like little growls over my spirit box. And I would see quick shadow movements. And it's weird because I'd see quick little, you know, uh, they look like little spiritual blobs. They don't look like, you know, short uh, figures like children or anything like that. They just look like little balls of, you know, blackness, like little blobs. And I would see them move darting out and from tombstones. And it'd be like, one's over here. And then you look over there and there's another one moving really fast in like a weird zigzag pattern. And there was something kind of disorienting about watching these things, especially out of the corner of my eye, just move. Because you felt like they were closing in on you. Like, when your back's turned, you're not paying attention, they're going to attack you. And meanwhile, I have the spear box going, I'm getting these angry responses. And, you know, it was a big change from when I had been to that cemetery a year and a few months prior. And... There was this one place I remember. It's the Fudo grave. I think that's how you say it's his name, but it's F O O T O. I think that's how you say his name. But he was a soldier in an expeditionary force in World War One, and he actually died in October of nineteen. I believe it's nineteen eighteen. So you know he didn't quite make the uh, Armistice Day, but. I can't remember where exactly, because I did research on where exactly he died, what battle, but there had been reports from people that investigated that cemetery previously that whenever you go to his grave, you get a lot of angry responses, and that he's not exactly a happy entity, whether it's, you know, he's upset about something that happened during his life, something that's happened over the course of the cemetery's history, or he's just unhappy, he's being disturbed in death, I don't know, but... He's an unhappy soul. And so I remember having my spirit box in front of his grave, and I was sitting there, and I was just asking questions, question after question, you know, trying to figure out, you know, about World War One, like, you know, what battles were you in? What was it like? That kind of stuff. And I would get these little grunts, like, rrr, rrr, things like that. And it was, it was creepy when, you know, it's unmistakable. When you know for 100% certainty that you're not hearing radio bleed through, it's not a technical problem. You know you're hearing 
something beyond our veil of existence, making a sound that you can hear. It's a little creepy. And I remember feeling just this presence all around me. And instantly, you know, I threw my guard up. And I went to another part of the cemetery. And I had my spirit box running. I had it running the entire time. Because you never know when a spirit's going to make its presence known. I was walking towards this old part of the cemetery I'd never been in before. And out of nowhere, there was this loud female scream. Almost like a scream in pain. And I almost threw the spirit box over my shoulder. Because, you know, I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't asking questions. I wasn't thinking anything. Like, you know, I wish a spirit would make its presence known. I was just walking to another part of the cemetery. And there was just this loud female scream. And it was just, it was freaky. It was disturbing. And instantly, every hair on the back of my neck and arms just stood straight up at attention and I started hearing stuff in the woods moving around and at that moment the very first thing that came to my mind was back up back up go to another part of the cemetery leave it alone and I don't know whether that was my mind looking out for me that was you know a vocalization of my gut feeling or if you know that's a guardian angel a guardian entity a guardian something something looking out for me that told me to do that and so I backed up but a few minutes later I decided to you know go against that voice and I did go to that part of the cemetery and I got a few voices over the spear box not really anything it was kind of anticlimactic and i was kind of disappointed because you know i hear this loud female scream that's clear as day over the spear box i hear crap moving around in the woods i thought i saw a few things moving around i get this way that says don't go there it's dangerous and then when i do go over there nothing happens but i do remember i started feeling really itchy on my chest just very very itchy and at the time I had, you know, spirit box in one hand, voice recorder in the other. So I was like, well, I can't exactly scratch, you know, my chest where it feels itchy because, you know, it'll contaminate the recording. It'll mess it up. So I continued the rest of the investigation. And as I was wrapping it up, I was going back to the vehicle and I started getting this itchy burning sensation on my chest. And so I was like, what the heck is this? And so I set my stuff down on the vehicle and I pulled up my shirt and there were three claw marks on my chest well there was about three pairs of them there was one going from almost like a sash from my top left about the shoulder down to a little past i guess the belly button area just this long scratch and then there were two other pairs of short three claw marks on my chest and it just looked like something was going to town on my chest and they were blood i had pictures of them of what they looked like and you know, something like that had never happened to me before. I had been scratched before on investigation, but, you know, it was just like, oh, one little scratch mark, and, you know, it wasn't anything, you know, oh, my God, get me a young priest and an old priest, but this was something that was different. And I also remember when I got home, uh, because I had to be home in time to hand out candy, because it was Halloween night, and I was helping uh, some family members hand out candy and I remember I was taking my shirt and hoodie off to get changed into something warmer and on my back I noticed that I had scratch marks all up and down my back and I was sitting I was like what the heck is this and my mind immediately tried to retrace my steps the entire time I was there I was like okay could I have scratched myself without remembering it could I have rubbed up against something I could have scratched it on the car ride home could I have scratched something on my back could I have you know could I have done this trying to find an explanation for these scratches and I never did still to this day I don't know what those scratches were and I remember that well one that was the last time i had been to that cemetery which you know now that i think about it i really want to go back (laughs) but still to this day whenever i think about those scratches i've never been scratched like that ever again i have had claw marks on me since then i have you know been hit before but you know i've never had what looked like a spirit cat go crazy on my chest and back 
that was the only thing, you know, it looked like to me was, you know, while I was standing there doing a session, a spirit was just, you know, clawing away at me, you know, Wolverine style. So, a few years goes by, actually, yeah, a few years goes by, and I get invited, I have a podcast show, Hour of Enlightenment, and I'm in military school, and I still do investigations every once in a while. I still go to cemeteries whenever I get a chance, but I don't have as much time to devote to the paranormal as I did, you know, because military school, it's a pretty long schedule. So I got invited to be one of the guest speakers at this event that was going on at St. Albans Sanatorium which was a location that I had always dreamed of going to, not just to investigate, but going, period. Because I'd always heard stories that St. Albans Sanatorium is one of the most haunted places in America. Crazy stuff happens there. There's people that say it's infested with demons and shapeshifters and hellhounds and these God-forsaken creatures that will give you nightmares. And so, naturally, I wanted to go. One, because I have the nature of... If I hear a claim of a location, you know, someone at this house claims to see Old Man Smith still wander the halls, or someone claims to see a demon that tries to possess you, I want proof. I want evidence that it exists, that it's happening, and I want to see it for myself. That's just how I approach the paranormal. I guess my motto when I hear paranormal claims is, show me. (laughs) But it's always respectful. You always have to be respectful when you're being skeptical. There is a way you can be respectfully skeptical. And when I heard all these stories about St. Albans, I was like, I want to see if, you know, this place is as active as people claim it is. And so I went and I spoke for a little bit. It was very cool. It was the very first time I had ever spoken in public in front of a crowd. And I think the crowd was maybe... 80 to 90 people, maybe 100 max. It wasn't, you know, a gigantic crowd, but it was still, it was a good start. And it was a great event. I had a great time. I just, you know, a location that for years I had been reading about, doing research on, seeing pictures up, hearing stories about. It was, it was really cool to not only be able to step foot there and walk amongst the halls. But to be honored to have been invited there, it was a really cool investigation. And I remember the very first part of the building I went in to investigate during that night was the bowling alley. And pretty much right from the get-go, it was active. And something that I had noticed about locations up until that point, and it was always a belief of mine up until that point, was typically it takes, you know, 10 to 15 minutes for the spirits to get warmed up, for them to get acclimated to who you are, your energy, the equipment, the equipment's energy, how to manipulate it, how to be able to speak over it, that kind of stuff. But with St. Albans Sanatorium, that pretty much threw all of that out the window for me. And I was like, crap, we've been here two minutes and we're already getting tons of voices that, you know, isn't radio. Because that's one of the tricky things about the spirit box is telling whether or not it's radio or spirit voice. But you know, where I had conducted at least 200 to 300 spirit box sessions before I got to St. Albans, I felt like I had a good grasp of, you know, when to tell it's a spirit voice and when it's radio. And so, you know, for me to be hearing three or four spirit voices, intelligent spirit voices, within two and three minutes of being there, you know, that was insane for me. I was like, holy crap, so far this location's living up to the hype. And I remember there was one video I recorded in the bowling alley about 20 minutes after we got there. And I had my video camera, my iPhone, I was using it as the video camera. And Chris had the spirit box. Actually, I had turned my spirit box off and someone else in the group had brought a spirit box, and they were letting theirs go, and I had the K2 meter outstretched in front of me, you know, to see if I could pick up any readings, and on video, I didn't see it in real time, and there was just next to the left, it was about to the top left of the K2, you can see, I've shared the video before on YouTube here on the Five Paranormal channel and on our Facebook page, but there was just this green light that shows up on screen, flies around a little bit, and then disappears off camera. 
And at the time, I didn't notice it because I guess I was talking to Chris or I was looking around. Someone had seen something or something like that. But it's plain as day. And, you know, if it had been someone walking or someone else's K2, I would have made note of it. That's something that I always do. Whenever there's, you know, someone coughs, someone whispers on investigation, I always make a note of it. So that when I'm reviewing later or someone else is reviewing the audio later, you know, they don't mistake it for a spirit voice or a spirit, you know, manifestation. And... Out of still to this day, that's probably the best spirit video I've ever recorded. And you know, come to mind, that's probably the only <laughs> spirit video I've ever recorded. But the rest of the night, I remember just being in awe of how much was going on in this one little location. And instantly, I felt that, you know, there was something calling me back to St. Albans. And that's something that a lot of people I've talked to that's been to St. Albans, they report themselves. They say, yeah, it feels like part of the building goes with you. And you hear this voice in your head, you have to go back. You have to go back. And that was pretty much me the day after I got back from St. Albans is, oh, you forgot to do this. Or what if you tried doing this? And then there was always that voice in the back of my head, you have to go back, you have to go back, you have to go back. And so, you know, that's the only location I've ever had that happen, you know. Oh, and it was weird because every time I've always went, whenever I guess the building's called, something insane has happened. Because a few days after the April 2nd event, I um, had a friend of mine that sent me a link to an event saying, hey, there's going to be this Friday the 13th event at St. Albans. Friday, May 13th. And they were hyping it up as, you know, what comes out to play on Friday the 13th. You know, bad thing. After the movie, you know, Friday the 13th, I guess it was, you know, they're, they're using, you know, the classic movie and the cliche that, oh, Friday the 13th is a cursed day. I guess they're using that, which, you know, it... If you give something like that power, like, you know, a cursed object, a cursed date, if you give it power, you give that, quote-unquote, curse or ability, power, recognition, then, yeah, it will manifest, not because it was there to begin with, but because you gave it power. And so Chris and I went, and I pretty much begged every single day, can we go, can we go, can we go, can we go? And then finally he agreed to go. And I remember when we pulled up to the building. It was evening time. It was starting to get sunset. But I remember going across the bridge of the New River. And you can see St. Albans up on the ridge there, up on the hill. And I remember it felt different. It looked different. Sure, it was, you know, sunset, the sun setting. You know, when the sun goes down, it gets darker. But there was something else to the building that night. It felt evil i know it's weird to say that a building looks and feels evil but it did that night and i've never seen any other location that came off and felt the way saint albans did on that night even on return trips to saint albans sanatorium it's never felt like that before i mean felt like that since and you know, we pulled around to the front of the building, you know, the classic, the picture you always see of the front of it. And I remember getting out of the truck and I was just, I was standing there just, you know, almost like I was frozen in place looking at the building. And I told Chris, I said, this feels evil. And he was like, yeah, it doesn't feel right. And it felt like you knew something was in there that was just inching, just waiting, just salivating for the investigation to start. And you knew whatever it was, it wasn't human, and it wasn't happy, and it wasn't peaceful. It was a negative presence. It was an evil presence that was, you know, letting itself be known even before you got to the building. I mean, we were halfway across the bridge over the New River when we started filling it. So, you know, that's a that's a pretty wide little area that its energy, its presence was being felt. And I remember one thing that you know I always do when I go to St. Albans is we don't exactly go in through the front door. We usually go through the um, the volunteer area where all the volunteers are because you know we have a lot of friends that are volunteers there. 
And, you know, we like to hang out and say hi to them, say, hey, what's going on here? But I remember that day when we showed up to the volunteer section, everyone just seemed kind of, you know, on edge. You know, even the people that are typically really nice, really outgoing, really friendly, there was just this, oh, hey, yeah, good you're here, yeah, something's going on, man, that kind of energy. That's what it felt like, and it didn't feel welcoming. It was, you know, not exactly welcoming. It was, you know, it felt like it wanted you in. It was trying to lure you in so that, you know, it can mess with you. And so the investigation started, and we were in a very small group. I think typically when they have these events at St. Albans, they have, you know, 10 people, 10 to 15 people in a group, depending. Some groups are bigger than others. But the ones we had always been in, which we're always in group one, even still to this day, we're always in group one. Um, we had usually had, you know, between 10 to 15 people. And this time we only had about seven or eight people. And so it was it was better. I like when it's smaller groups because less contamination and it feels a bit more like an actual investigation. It doesn't feel like, you know, a public investigation with a hundred other people in the building. So the very first area we went to, we pretty much retraced our steps from the April second investigation. And we went to the bowling alley. And I remember there was this there was a presence. It felt like it was hiding in the corners of the bowling alley, the very back corner of the bowling alley, like, you know, where the pins would be stocked and held. It felt like there was just something hiding. And at one point, you know, it wasn't making its presence known. We weren't getting hardly any voice, but we weren't getting radio feedback either, which is pretty interesting. It was just, you know, the spear box was dead, pun intended. And I remember being a little fed up with it. I was like, I know there's something back in that corner. Darn it, I'm going to see what it is. And so I took the voice recorder, I took a flashlight, and I went back there. And, you know, sometimes when you're going through things like that, when you feel, you know there is something, not someone, something back there. You kind of feel, you know, your mind's going a million miles an hour. What's going to be back here? What's going to happen? Oh, crap, I'm by myself. This could go really wrong. But I remember getting back there, and nothing happened. The feeling, the energy of something hiding back there was gone. It just disappeared. And I was a little annoyed because, you know, I was like, oh, it was almost like, you know, throwing fish bait out when you're fishing, and when the fish goes for the fish food, you pull it, you reel it in real fast where it can't get it. That's kind of what it felt like. And that happened many times during the course of that investigation. It was annoying. And I remember Chris and I, we ended up splitting off a little bit from the group, and we went to the boiler room. And there were two other people that were in the boiler room with us, and we were doing a spear box session, just a normal spear box session. And I remember out of the corner of my eye, we were about, if you've been to St. Albans, we were in the middle of the room where it's, you know, it's to the right of the machine where they always have the cigarettes lined up for Old Smokey when the spirit's there. Um, and we were standing kind of in like a half circle type thing. We were just had the spirit box running. One of the other people had dowsing rods and they were using that, which was kind of cool. And I remember in the back corner of the room, I kept seeing something dart left to right. And at first it was like, oh, cool, something crazy is happening. Oh, it's only a few feet away. Wow. And there was even one time, I swear, I felt the wind of something rush by. But after a while, you know, about five or six minutes, it started getting on my nerves because, you know, I would see something and I would know it's there. I would, you know, it started with me seeing it out of the corner of my eye and then I started seeing it head on. And every time I would ask who's back there, we wouldn't get a response. Nothing would happen. Every time I would go back there, there would be nothing. So finally, and you know, this is kind of uncharacteristic of me. I got angry. And typically on a paranormal investigation, I, I usually keep my cool. I know I like to keep myself, as I like to put it, balanced. Um, you know, I don't get too excited. I don't get too scared. I don't get too really anything because, you know, if you get too excited, then you're over eager. You might mess something up. You might get hurt. You might ruin an experience. But if you get too scared, then, you know, you not only run away subconsciously from spirit activity, but you invite negative stuff to prey upon your fear. And I remember it was different that night because I didn't feel like it, I was completely in control of my emotions. 
and I got really, really angry. And I took, you know, my Olympus voice record, the very first one that I got when I was 10 for Easter, and I was like, I'm coming back there. Make your presence known now. And I remember, you know, Chris was like, Jake, what are you doing? And I just stormed back there. I had the recorder outstretched in front of me. And I was going navigating through the equipment. I was going to get to that back corner to see what was messing with me. Because, you know, other people in the group, they weren't seeing this figure dart back and forth. I was the only one. And it was ticking me off. Because I was like, okay, it's going to make me sound crazy. Make it seem like, oh, I'm seeing something every second. And so, as I got close to the back corner of the building, I mean, not the building, but of the boiler room, I started smelling wet fur. And I stopped in my tracks. I was like, why am I smelling wet fur? And I started, I was still going back to the back corner slowly. And then finally, I saw movement of something in that back corner. And instantly, you know, the adrenaline kicked in. I was like, ha, I see you. I got you cornered. And I started, you know, rushing back there when all of a sudden I heard this hiss. This really loud hiss with my own ears. All of us in the room heard it. Even the other three people in the room, they heard it over the spirit box. It was just like this sound. And we recorded it. I've shared the clip here a few times, and I have it on Facebook. But it instantly triggered something in my mind. I remembered, oh, wait, one of the creatures that said to haunt this place is the goat man. I was like, goat's hiss i was like oh crap (laughs) did i just piss off the freaking goat man and i remember just stopping dead in my tracks and i could feel almost like you know i was lured into a venus fly trap i was like oh crap it's got me (laughs) and i could hear chris jake back up slowly back up back up and i slowly started backing up and I was just waiting, you know, to see and hear something else, but we never did. For the rest of the time we were in that room, we never saw or heard anything else. I never saw the figure dart, but, you know, that was the first time in that building I had heard something with my own ears that loud and pronounced. And I'll be honest, it was freaky. (laughs) It was a little disturbing. So, let fast forward to about midnight, and the building had just this... It seemed like as the night went on, it got more evil or evil. I don't know what the exact correct term there would be. And to the point to where there was, during one of our breaks, when they have their public investigation, you investigate for 45 minutes, and then you take a 15-minute break. Investigate for 45, take 15. And during one of the breaks, this lady came by, and she had some guides that were helping her walk, and she was holding her stomach. And I was like, what the heck's going on here? And she had been up in, I'm trying to remember, up in the birdcage area. And something had punched her. Like straight up, you know, Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali style, punched her in her chest. And I was like, holy crap. (laughs) And, you know, the next area that we were going to go to was the area that they called Demon Hallway, which, you know, was pretty fitting, you know, someone just got punched, and I encountered the goat man, and now at 12 o'clock, possibly the most active time at night, we're going to Demon Hallway, so I remember I was making jokes about that just a little bit, because that's, you know, for me, I like to insert humor into situations, because, you know, one, it eases my mind, and I think it eases, you know, others, you know, something scary is happening, something bad's happening, if you can add just a little humor to make someone, you know, when you laugh, you give off positive energy. And positive energy is what you use to combat negative energy. And so, you know, I was joking around a little bit like, oh, demon hallway. <laughs> what do you think we'll see there? Maybe demons and, you know, stupid jokes like that. And we were going down the hallway, demon hallway. And Chris and I decided that we were going to go to Jacob's room. And everyone's like, okay. And so we just split off. And the same people that have been in the boiler room with us, you know, they've joined us. And the spirit, we started a spirit box session in Jacob's room. And it was very, very active. Um, but about halfway through, about maybe 10 or so minutes, we started getting this rough, scratchy, kind of metallic voice, which typically those are the sounds that a non human entity makes. And. We were trying to figure out, you know, is this possibly an elemental? 
is this a demonic entity? What exactly is making its presence known to us? And we started hearing footsteps outside in the hallway. And, you know, we would peek out the room to see no one would be there. And it's one of those hallways where there's one way in, one way out. We were next to the only way in. So if someone had walked into the hallway, we would have seen them. I was facing the door the entire time, and I never saw anybody. Even when the footsteps were going on, I never saw anybody. And so we got the idea, actually Chris got the idea after a while, to turn off the spear box and see if we could, you know, hear something with our own ears. And so, you know, we waited and... We thought we heard a few things every once in a while, but we attributed it to other members of the group because we're like, well, they should be in the next hallway over, sound travels. But, you know, looking back, could we have been hearing mumbling or something else of some other spirit? And finally, I asked, can you make your presence known to us now in this room? And there was just, it sounded like it came from inside the Jacob's room, our room. There was just this loud growl, and it was deep guttural and loud and it went on for about three seconds and we all just stopped <laughs> and looked at it we we're like oh crap but the, here's the weird thing when i went back and looked on the voice recorder the crowd isn't recorded the voice recorder that was running in an otherwise silent room did not record this loud growl but you can hear us react to it but there was no growl And so we all started getting this really bad feeling. And about this time, one of the people that was in the room with us, he pulled out his phone. was like, well, here, I'm going to take pictures of the doorway because we were hearing stuff walking around the doorway. So it was weird because as he was taking photos with Flash, we heard something walk in front of the door as he was taking the photos. And it was disturbing because he got the photos. He's like, uh, guys... (laughs) And he showed us, he took three photos. The first photo, there was like a half black mass that was covering half the door. And it was creepy because the entire door, half of the door was blacked out. You couldn't see it. It was like looking into an abyss. The second photo, mind you, these were taken with flash. The second photo was completely blacked out. The door was completely blacked out. As in, you couldn't see out the door. Something was big enough to completely cover the door from top to bottom, side to side. And then in the third photo, it was on the right side of the door half. So something was caught on camera moving left to right when we heard something moving left to right. And I recorded it on the voice recorder of something moving left to right. And so about this time, you know, Chris looked at me like, Uh uh-oh, this isn't good. And we started hearing, you know, more footsteps in the room across from us. And finally, we asked, if you're here, if you're really here, what's the loudest sound you can make? And we waited and waited. And a little bit later, about maybe 30 seconds, it was the sound of all hell breaking loose. It sounded like, you know, dishes were being broken. It sounded like glass was shattering. It sounded like multiple people were stomping and running around in the room across from us. It literally just sounded like all hell broke loose in this room. But see, here was the crazy thing. We were all just, you know, mesmerized. We were stunned at, you know, complete pandemonium taking place in this room that we were looking in and not seeing anything. You know, and it was loud to the point where we were almost covering our ears. It was so loud. And, you know, I just remember standing in the doorway, looking in the room and hearing all this go on, but not seeing anything. I didn't see anything move. I didn't see anyone else in there. It was freaky. (laughs) I still to this day have never experienced anything like that. So a little bit goes by and all of a sudden our guide rushes in and he's like, he's freaking out. He looks like, you know, like he's seen a ghost. (laughs) He's like, where have you all been? We've been looking for you. And we're like, we've been right here where we've told you. We came out of the room and everyone was at the landing down the stairs next to Jacob's room. But they never heard us. We never heard them, which, you know, it's an echoey building. And the staircase that leads to that landing is right next to Jacob's room. It's literally like a foot away from Jacob's room. So if a group of seven people were to walk by, we would have heard them. We would have seen their shadows on the wall, but we didn't. And there's no other stairwell they could have taken. 
So how did they get there without us hearing them? And how did they not hear us that entire time? And how did they not hear those other sounds? And so the last thing I remember is Chris and I were talking to the guide. And the next thing you know, we were in this separate room. And we had never been in this room before, but it was in Demon Hallway. And it was the Evan Radford room. And I remember I had my voice recorder out, and I was looking at this old newspaper clipping of John F. Kennedy. And I was just reading it. Chris was over by the window looking over Radford at night. And I caught movement of something out of the corner of my eye. And I looked over at the door, and there was this thing just standing there. And the only way I can describe it is a blob. It was, it looked to be about seven, seven and a half feet tall. It was wider than the door frame. And when I first saw it in the doorway, I just saw big black eyes and this weird looking mouth. And I instantly was like, holy expletive, you know, insert expletive here. And for some reason, I chased after it, which is, you know, if you're listening to this, do not chase after anything really pretty much that's pretty much a good rule (laughs) of thumb you know whether you're chasing a wild animal or anything like that you don't chase after it and especially for the parent when you see a blob creature you don't chase after it it doesn't end well and this really didn't end well so i chased after and chris is like what 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 what's going on and so I chased it through this room out into a hallway and I remember in my mind all I could think of was I gotta catch it gotta catch it gotta catch it and I was basically in a full sprint running after this thing and then it stopped we ran out into demon hall and it stopped at the landing where you can either go upstairs into the attic or you can continue going down the hallway and it stopped and it did like this basketball pivot move and it stopped and faced me and I stopped dead in my tracks and you know I was running so fast at a full-on sprint I stopped maybe three feet away from this thing and I was not only seeing it with my own eyes I was standing three feet away from this thing this evil creature from hell (laughs) and I remember looking into its eyes and it was completely all black just this blob shape and if you've ever seen the movie the blob the classic one it looked like a standing version of that and that's why I still this day I call it the blob creature and I remember inside it had these huge black eyes that were the size of dinner plates maybe even a little bigger and it didn't have a nose it didn't have any, you know, human-like features. It was just this blob. But its head, the top of it rounded off uh, in like a, almost like a perfect circle up top. And it had this huge mouth and this really big crooked smile that just looked pure evil. And I remember in its body, it almost looks like, you know, if you've ever seen the simulations of what a black hole looks like, the way it swirls, that's what it looked like it had in its body was these little swirls. And I just remember there was this heat, not a stinky smell like, you know, some people that say when they're around demons, it smells like rotten flesh or excrement or things like that. It just, you know, it smelled wrong, but I couldn't really place it. It's kind of like a sulfur gunpowder smell, uh, which is nothing that's attributed to the demonic. And I just remember this heat radiating off of it. It was almost like, like the heat was pulsating like whoom, 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 off of it. And Chris ran into him and he's like, what the insert his expletive here. And he was like, Jake, back up very slowly. We're going to go back into this room. Don't turn your back to it. And so I remember we were just walking very slowly. And mind you, I had the voice recorder in my hand. And this thing, when it ran, I described it as it took off and it ran, but it was more like, it glided across the floor, just this unnatural looking way of moving. And we went back to the doorway of Evan Radford's room and the thing started following us. And it followed us to the doorway 
pretty much of this other room, this room which I call Psychedelic Finding Nemo or Evil Octopus's Garden because there's mural. It used to be the old nursery, and you know it has a bunch of murals of an octopus, happy looking fish, and a happy underwater scene. Which over time, someone has painted red eyes and black eyes on the fish and stuff. There's a few weird looking pentagram type things, and that's why I call it you know an evil room. It looks pure evil, and it was the creature, the blob was standing in the doorway of that room. And I remember I pulled out the spirit box, and we were trying to communicate with this thing. And we were getting some of the clearest voices I had ever heard over the spirit box. Still to this day, I've never heard voices as clear as that. Like, its voice over the spirit box was as clear as my voice is talking to you now. It was that clear. And it spoke in this very scratchy it sounded like an older male voice, but it's very scratchy and very metallic, almost like it was talking into a vocoder, if you know what that is, or, you know, it's using like a light version of autotune, something like that. It just, it sounded evil, almost robotic. And, you know, it wouldn't tell us who it was, but it was saying things like, I'm evil, or you run, or things like that. Just, you know, those creepy cryptic things. And... You know, I remember after a while, the thing started inching its way closer to us, closer and closer, and backing us up pretty much into a corner. And Chris was like, Jake, for our own safety, we have to get out of here. We have to get back, go across the hallway somehow, and get to the rest of our group. And so we decided, you know what, we were going to basically make a break for it. <laughs> and so we, you know, we closed the session saying, all right, you know, we're heading out, peace. We didn't say that, but we basically said that. And as we were leaving, I could see this thing in the corner of my eye, just standing in the hallway with this grin, just looking at it, slowly moving towards us. And when we got to the rest of our group, everyone was like, oh, hey, <laughs> you know, like nothing had happened. And it was weird because... On the voice recorder, when I went back and reviewed the audio, only one of the blob creature's voices picked up. Even though, according to the voice recorder, we had a 10-minute, the entire experience of, you know, first seeing it versus when we left the hallway, it was about 10 minutes. And it was speaking to us basically the entire time. But only one voice was recorded. One voice during that entire 10 minutes was recorded. And it wasn't even that clear. And so, you know, this thing literally erased it from our files. And the thing that was even weirder, well, almost as weird, was when we talked to the other people in the group, they were like, yeah, you've only been gone for two minutes. And we were like, no, <laughs> we've been gone for about 10 or 10 plus minutes. They're like, no, according to our watches. And so everyone else's watches on, you know, their wrists and on their phones said that we had only been gone for two minutes. But our voice recorder said that we had been gone 10 minutes. From, and I have the timestamp of, you know, when I was last talking to the guide. Because there is a mission of, you know, we were talking to the guy. We were starting to go down the stairs, and then we're in Evan Radford's room. And it was about 10, 11 minutes. So we lost about 8 or 9 minutes of lost time. And that's the only time I've ever experienced that. Still to this day, I've never had that happen. And, you know, that is, even still to this day, the scariest experience I've ever had in the paranormal field because that experience, every time I think about it, even when I'm telling you about the experience now, I still get the same feeling in my chest that I got when I first saw that creature. And that's, you know, this very sick feeling. The feeling of, like, a cannonball is sinking into your chest. And it's not a feeling that I like. <laughs> it's not a good feeling. And it's one that, you know, I have been back tw once, actually twice since then. And I've never experienced anything like that. Again, I have run into other demonic entities. I've had some crazy stuff happen, but nothing on that level. But I've always wanted to go back armed with, you know, my new knowledge, my new equipment, and just try to see exactly who or what. Well, not really who. I know it was a what. What that thing was. Now, folks, I hope you all have enjoyed this episode. It went a little bit over the hour mark, but that's okay. Um, what was your favorite experience that I shared with you today? And what is the scariest 
and coolest experience you have had in the paranormal field? Comment below. And thank you all for tuning in to this episode of The Fife Files. Once again, I am your host, Jake Fife. We will have another episode this upcoming Saturday. Actually, Friday is when we will have it up. And have a great day, everyone.